In lesson 5.4, exponentials, differentiation, and integration. We will focus differentiation and integration, but primarily on the exponential function, which we usually refer to as simply the letter E, or Euler's number. Now, as you should know from previous courses, E is in fact the inverse function of the natural logarithm. If you weren't aware of that, Take a look back at lesson 5.3 and use the information that we garnered from that lesson to look at the relationship between E and the natural log. And hopefully you can convince yourself that they are in fact inverses. So what we're going to do in this lesson is take a look at E. We're going to differentiate E and you're going to find out that it is the easiest, most awesome function to differentiate. From there, we'll talk about integrating E and you'll learn that E is the awesomest and coolest uh, function to integrate. It's just an awesome function all around. I promise you're going to love it because it actually is extremely easy and it will actually make sense too when you look at the graphs of it and such. So anyway, all that being said, uh, before we get into any of the rules or tricks or anything like that, let's go ahead and take a look at our first example, example A, where we will also talk about some important functions that your calculator can do for you. Let's go ahead and begin. So in example A, we're asked to graph these two functions given here, uh, y sub 1 equals e to the 2x and y sub 2 equals e to the negative 3x. Uh, you are, of course, expected to do that in your graphing calculator, but I've done that here separately on two separate sets of axes, and I want to show you how you can do this in your calculator and actually find the derivative at this given point right here without having to do any math yourself. Yes, the calculator will find the derivative for you. Now, don't rely on the calculator because you won't always get to use it. Uh, but in the special circumstance where you can use it, you really need to know how. So go ahead in your calculator and begin by graphing the first equation, y sub 1 equals e to the 2x. When you graph that, you should get a graph similar to the one I have here, uh, y sub 1 equals e to the 2x. Of course, uh, your graph will probably be in the standard viewing window. Uh, I've zoomed it in a little bit, but no big deal. And what we're asked to do here is to find the slope of the tangent line that I've drawn here. This is the dashed black line here that is tangent to this graph at the point 0, 1. So how do we find the slope of that tangent line? Well, if you're in your calculator and you're looking at this graph right now, what I want you to do, if you have a TI-83 or 84 that is, is go ahead and hit second calc. Uh, that's actually the trace button at, uh, along that top row of five keys up there, uh, second trace, which is the uh, calculate menu. You'll see that down in that menu, there'll be an option that says dy dx. That is the option that will find the slope for you. So go down and hit enter on that option. Now what's going to happen, it's going to bring you back to the graph, and it's going to ask you where do you want to evaluate the derivative. Uh, probably by default, it's already at x equals 0. But if not, you can literally just hit 0 and then enter. What it's going to do now is it's going to show you the point on the graph where x equals 0. And there at the bottom of the screen, it's going to tell you the derivative. Now, understand, this derivative is only approximate. The calculator does not know how to do calculus. It's just following algorithms. But look what it says. Is it telling you that dy dx for this graph at x equals 0, uh, let's see here, at x equals 0, is equal to 2? If so, that's uh, not really that surprising once I show you how to do the derivative of an exponential function. But now that we've done that, let's go ahead and try this other graph over here. Go ahead and graph in your calculator y sub 2 equals e to the negative 3x. Of course, you can go ahead and overwrite your first function. You don't need to call this y sub 2. It really makes no difference. But once this graph shows up on your screen, it should look like this red graph here. Uh, of course, because it's e to the negative 3x, this is actually a uh, decreasing function. Um, hopefully, you've learned a little bit about growth and decay in previous courses. So you know that e to the 2x is exponential growth, while e to the negative 3x is exponential uh, decay or decline or however you want to call it. So if you're looking at this graph in your calculator, go ahead and do the same thing we did before to evaluate the derivative at the point x equals 0. Uh, let's see here. 
If you go through and do that correctly, find the derivative where x equals 0, it should give you something along the lines of negative 3. Of course, it might give you negative 3.00005 or something like that. But remember that this is only an approximation that the calculator is giving you. However, it is quite interesting to note that these approximations, uh, if you look at the uh, exponent in this exponential, the 2x, notice that our slope of the tangent line was 2 when x equals 0. And over here on this one, the exponent was negative 3x, and the slope of the tangent line was negative 3. You might be asking yourself, is there something going on here? And I'm going to tell you that, in fact, there is. And with this exercise, I'm going to pause here and move on so that we can actually look at the derivative of the exponential function. Then I want you to go back, look at example A, and see that it did, in fact, make a whole lot of sense. Let's go ahead and look at these derivatives now. So I said in the introduction to this lesson that the derivative of the exponential function was easy and is one of my favorite derivatives to do. Now I get to prove to you why. It can be proven a lot of different ways, what I'm about to show you, but I'm just going to go ahead and present this to you without proof so that we can move on and apply this knowledge. But if we're differentiating e to the x, just standard e to the x, all we're going to end up with, surprisingly, is e to the x. That's right, the exponential e is its own derivative. That is amazing. What that means is that every point along the curve e to the x is going to have a derivative of e to the x for whatever value of x I'm at. It's a quite uh, astounding fact, and you can prove it to yourself if you simply draw the graph of e to the x and find the derivative at any point along that curve. Of course, you know how to find the derivative in the calculator now, and now you know how to find the derivative by hand as well. But what if it's not just e to the x? What if it's something, uh, if we're trying to find the derivative of e to the u? This is actually what we did in example a, because we had e to the 2x and e to the negative 3x. It wasn't always just e to the x. In fact, it rarely is. Uh, but if we have e to the u, where u represents some function, and we want to differentiate it, this is also extremely easy. We're just going to end up with e to the u du. That's the chain rule, in effect. We're doing e to the u, so all that is staying the same. But then we have to differentiate that exponent, and there's our chain rule. So that's why uh, when we did the derivative of e to the 2x uh, at x equals 0, of course, what we ended up with was 2e to the 2x. And if you plug in 0 for x right here, take a look at what you will get. You'll get 2 which is exactly what we found out in example A. So, pretty cool, huh? Well, with that, let's go ahead and uh, apply this knowledge towards finding some extreme uh, points of inflection and good stuff like that. Let's go ahead and move on to example B. So, here in example B, we're going to use something that we've done many times before, but with a new twist now that we're dealing with this exponential E function. We're going to go through and try to find all the extrema and the points of inflection of this function. Now, we've been finding extrema and points of inflection for a long while now, but only now do we understand how to do this with all these e's going on. So, of course, to find the extrema, we first need to go ahead and differentiate this function. And we know how to do that. The derivative of e to the x right here is, of course, just e to the x. And then we'll subtract the derivative of e to the negative x, which is, uh, e to the negative x times the derivative of this, which is negative 1, which actually just makes this positive. No big deal. And then we'll divide that by 2. Now, to find our extrema, we need to find where this first derivative either equals 0 or does not exist. Clearly, there's nowhere that it doesn't exist. There's no value of x I can put in here where the function goes haywire, so no worries there. Uh, where does this function equal 0, however? In other words, I guess what I'm asking is, where is e to the x power equal to negative e to the negative x power? And uh, that looks a little confusing, but try as you might, you will not find anywhere 
where x gives us a correct result here. You might say, oh, well, maybe x is uh, 0. Maybe for x equals 0. Well, e to the 0 and negative e to the 0, those are not the same. 1 does not equal negative 1. And so uh, what we can only conclude here is that there are no extrema to this function. Good or bad, it is what it is. To find points of inflection, of course, we need to do the second derivative. And so let's go ahead and differentiate our first derivative. Again, we have uh, e to the x, which is just going to give us e to the x. And when we differentiate e to the negative x, that's going to give us negative e to the negative x. And again, we'll divide that by 2. Just like with extrema, we need to set this equal to 0 or determine where it doesn't exist. There's nowhere where it doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and solve this for 0. What we'll have is uh, we need to find where e to the x equals e to the negative x. And that does happen. Uh, in fact, if we put 0 in for x, we'll have e to the 0 here. Uh, e to the negative 0, uh, those are, in fact, equal. So at x equals 0, we do have a point of inflection. Now, if I want to check this just to be absolutely sure, I could set up a couple intervals, of course, negative infinity to 0, and then 0 to positive infinity. And if we do that, and I want to check my second derivative, uh, what we'll find is that in our first interval from negative infinity to 0, I can take whatever value I like in that interval and plug it in here, and I'll find that our function is concave down from negative infinity to 0. And if we do the same thing for the second interval, we'll find that our function is concave up, solidifying the fact that x equals 0 is, in fact, a point of inflection. In fact, let me go ahead and show you the graph of this function. And there it is. As you can see, uh, the function does begin concave down. And at x equals 0, it becomes concave up. Are there any extrema that you see? Of course not. This function is strictly monotonic. In fact, it's monotonic positive. Um, so there are no uh, ups and then downs or anything like that. So there is how we can use e to find uh, extrema and points of inflection. Let's do one more example like this, uh, maybe a little bit more of a um, involved example, let's say, uh, with example c. Go ahead and try this before we get there, because I promise this is going to be a fun and exciting one. So here in example C, we're going to do pretty much the same thing we did in example B, except our function is going to be a little bit different because we are going to have to apply the product rule in order to differentiate this. So I'm not going to do all the work. Uh, I will give you the derivative, but I certainly encourage you to pause the video and see if you get this derivative yourself. So go ahead and pause, work this out. And when you come back, I will show you the derivative. And in fact, here it is. Uh, in its factored form, what we should get is e to the negative x multiplied by the quantity 1 minus x. So uh, if we want to find the uh, critical values of this, uh, well, there's nowhere that x doesn't exist. But if I set this equal to 0, what I will find is that x equals 0 I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, derivative equals 0, rather, when x equals 1. And so it appears that we might have a critical point to deal with at x equals 1, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, of course, to find the points of inflection, we're going to need the second derivative. So you can take whatever method you'd like to find the second derivative. Uh, you can distribute this and then differentiate the whole thing. Uh, you can differentiate it as it is with the product rule. Your choice. But if you do it correctly, uh, in fact, pause the video and try it yourself just to see. But if done correctly, what we should end up with is e to the negative x multiplied by the quantity x minus 2. And again, if we want to find points of inflection, we need to set this equal to 0. And we'll find that we have a possible point of inflection at x equals 2. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm not going to say that this is definitely a maximum or a minimum. I don't know for sure yet. I'm not going to say that this is definitely a point of inflection, uh, although I have a, a very good suspicion of it. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out a little table like what we used to do back in a previous chapter. Uh, I'm going to do some intervals here. I will do the interval from negative infinity to 1. 
Uh, and then I will do the uh, interval from 1 to 2. And finally, I'll do an interval from 2 to infinity. Now, if we go ahead and do the first derivative test on each one and the second derivative test, again, I'm going to encourage you, pause the video and fill in this table on your own. I'm not going to go through all the steps, but I will fill out the table. So when you're ready, come on back. And hopefully you've done it by now, because I'm about to reveal the answers. Uh, the first derivative is positive in the first interval, uh, but then it's negative in the next two intervals. So it does appear that I do have a relative maximum at x equals 1. And I'll go ahead and write that here, uh, that x equals 1 is a relative max. Now, as far as the second derivative goes, uh, if you did this correctly, you should find that the second derivative is negative in the first two intervals and positive in the third interval. And what that tells me is that x equals 2 is, in fact, a point of inflection. Well, of course, because the concavity changes from negative to positive, so it must be a point of inflection. Well, finally, the directions do say to graph this function to verify our results. And so if we go ahead and graph the function, you'll see that, in fact, there is a point marked there at x equals 1. That is the relative max. And of course, if we plug that back into the function, what we'll get is that that point is 1 comma 1 over e. That is a relative max. And it is marked on the graph, as you see. Uh, as far as the point of inflection, it's really, really hard to tell the point of inflection on this graph because well, because it has that horizontal asymptote, and it approaches it in just such a way that it's really, really hard to see that the inflection changes. Nevertheless, if you graph this in your calculator, you will see that there is a point of inflection there at the point 2 comma 2 over e squared. And again, that is the point that I have marked on the graph as well. So you can see that we do have a relative max. We do have a point of inflection. This is all stuff we've done in the past. But now, with the exponential function, it becomes pretty cool. So there we go. Uh, before we get to example D, where we're going to be working with integrals, perhaps we should take a look at how to integrate the exponential function. Just as the derivative of the exponential is one of my favorite derivatives to do, I'll argue that the integral of the exponential is one of my favorite integrals. I'll show you. Let's go ahead and take a look. So here we're going to discuss the uh, integral of the natural exponential function. Um, think about this. Think about this. If we know that the derivative of e to the x gives us e to the x, then what must the integral of e to the x give us? And that's our first little um, definition right here. The integral of e to the x dx is simply going to be e to the x plus our constant of integration. No big deal. Easy as anything. Well, the second one is relatively easy as well. Uh, remember that by the chain rule, if we're differentiating e to the u, what we're going to get is e to the u du. So of course, if we wanted to integrate e to the u du, what would we get? Well, that would just bring us right back to e to the u plus c. Be very careful, though. In order to integrate, we do need to have the derivative of the exponent somewhere in the integral as well. So don't just see e to the 2x and integrate that to get e to the 2x. That would not be correct. After all, if you were to differentiate, as we've already seen, e to the 2x, that would not give us e to the 2x. It would give us 2e to the 2x. So be careful. Make sure that the derivative of the exponent is somewhere in the function as well so that that can be absorbed into our du. We'll do a few examples of this, just in case it is a little bit confusing. So let's go ahead and proceed with example d. So in example d, we're going to go ahead and integrate this function here. And it looks like a real big mess of a function. But if we consider a u substitution, I'm going to argue that it's really not all that bad. So what will our u substitution uh, involve here? Well, remember that we like this e to the u stuff, e to the u. Uh, so perhaps u should be the exponent on the e. In this case, that's 1 over x squared. And if that's the case, then our du will simply be the derivative of this. 
And in this case, that's simply going to be negative 2 over x cubed dx. So, so far, so good. Uh, we see that we have uh, e to the u hanging out here. Uh, do we have du? We need a negative 2 over x cubed. We do have x cubed, but in order to make this work, we're going to need a negative 2 up here in the uh, numerator. So let me go ahead and just throw a negative 2 in there, which I'm going to balance with a negative 1 half on the outside. So here's our negative 1 half. And the negative 2 and the x cubed will be absorbed into our du. So we'll end up with this as our actual problem that we're doing. And can we integrate this? Well, this looks a lot like the box that we just did. The uh, integral of e to the u du is really just e to the u. And don't forget the plus c, of course. Now, our last step, we can't leave it this way. We do need to unsubstitute, if you will. So what we're going to end up with is negative 1 half e to the u, which is 1 over x squared, plus c. Could it really be that easy? That almost seems like it was too simple. But go ahead and prove it to yourself. Go ahead and differentiate our result and see what you don't get um, for your derivative. I have a sneaking suspicion it'll be exactly where we started. Give it a shot and try. And when you're satisfied, we can go ahead and move on to example E. Wow, example E looks brutal. Look at all this. We have a secant 2x in the exponent. We have a secant 2x and a tangent 2x hanging out out here. This looks terrible until we do our u du substitution. Because remember, what we want u to be is simply the exponent here, which in this case is secant of 2x. Now, based off that, what would du be? Well, remember that the derivative of secant u is simply secant u tangent u and du, which would put a 2 in front of everything. Now, I'll put a dx here. but Wow, if you take a look at this, this looks like an awful du until you realize that that is almost exactly what is written out here. What's the only thing missing? What's the only thing we need to correct for? Uh, that's going to be this 2 that's hanging out. So if we go ahead and stick a 2 right here and balance it with a 1 half outside, uh, what we're going to end up with is, once again, this is going to look a lot like the last problem. It'll be 1 half the integral of e to the u du. Wow, that looks like the last one we just did. But let's go ahead and work it out. Uh, that, of course, will give us uh, 1 half e to the u plus c. And if we unsubstitute, we're going to end up with 1 half e to the secant 2x plus c. That, again, just like example d, seems to be a little way too easy. But give it a shot. Uh, differentiate our result and see that it does, in fact, work. Now, I don't want to fool you. We've just done two consecutive examples where all we had to do was throw a 2 and a 1 half to balance the whole thing out. It's not always quite that easy. Uh, sometimes it's a 3 and a 1 third. Ah. And, you know, sometimes it could be a little bit more than that. Always be on the lookout for uh, constants like pi's or pi squared and things like that. But if you're cognizant of the fact that you need du to exist in the original integral, then you'll have no problem with these at all. So all that being done, let's take a look at one last example. It's a uh, another revisit to a slope field. Good times. Let's take a look now. So here in our last example, example f, we are given a differential equation. Uh, we're told that dy dx is equal to x e to the power of negative 0.2x squared. Uh, and we're given this slope field uh, that you see over here. So uh, what we're asked to do is draw two solutions on this slope field, uh, one of which passes through that blue point, which of course is 0 comma negative 1.5. So uh, let me go ahead and draw two solutions for you. There you go. Um, you see that both of them follow the path of these little pieces of slope as we go. Uh, but what is the actual function? that defines these two graphs. Well, for that, we're going to need a little bit of calculus. And so let's see how this works. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my differential equation, and I'm going to split it up a little bit so that it says dy uh, equals x e to the negative 0.2x squared d 
DX. I've just split up my DY and DX. That way, I can go ahead and integrate both parts of it, and uh, hopefully that'll put me on the right track. So of course, to integrate this, I'm going to have to do a little UDU substitution. Uh, let's see what that looks like. Of course, U, I'm going to let that be negative 0.2x squared. Uh, that, so that can be the exponent on my E there. And therefore, DU is going to have to be negative 0.4x dx. And do you see what I'm missing? I'm missing that negative 0.4. So uh, let me go ahead and rewrite this with that thrown in. Uh, I'll have the integral of dy on the left. Over here on the right, uh, I'll have negative 1 over 0.4. That will help balance. Because inside, I will have negative 0.4. And that's the new part that I'm adding in. All of the rest of this is from the original problem. So uh, my apologies, it looks like my text is starting to run together. But there we go. And uh, now that I have that, well, the integral of dy on the left side, that's just y. No problem there. Uh, here, negative 1 over 0 0.4. Uh, maybe it would be nicer if I just called that negative 2.5. You can do it for yourself and see that is what it is. Uh, but inside here, I will have e to the u, and I do have my du now. So that's pretty nice and easy. Now that I've put that 0.4 in there, it compressed the problem to something that's not too bad. So let me go ahead and actually integrate this. I'll get negative 2.5 e to the u. And uh, of course, u is negative 0.2x uh, squared. And let me include my plus c. So whatever value I choose to put in for C, it should give me a graph kind of what like I have over here on this slope field. Uh, we just need to figure out what the correct value of C is so that our graph passes through the point 0 comma negative 1.5. How are we going to do that? Well, let me just plug in the point 0 comma negative 1.5, and we'll just algebraically solve for C. So of course, Y is negative 1.5. so. There's negative 1.5 equals negative 2.5 e to the, uh, well, x needs to be 0. So look what we're going to get here. We'll have e to the 0 plus c. Well, you can do the algebra yourself. Uh, the algebra here is actually pretty easy. And what we should end up with is that c is just equal to 1, meaning that our final equation, our final solution to this is actually going to be y equals negative 2.5 e to the negative 0.2x squared plus 1. Go ahead and graph this in your calculator. See if it doesn't look like these graphs we've drawn here on the slope field. And see if the graph does not, in fact, pass through our point 0 comma negative 1.5. Pretty beautiful, isn't it? All right, so here in lesson 5.4, we haven't covered a whole lot of new information, uh, but we have taken a look uh, very extensively, in fact, at the natural exponential function, that's e. Now remember that e is, in fact, the inverse of the natural log, so that is going to become very, very important later on. Uh, in this lesson, I showed you how to use the derivative function on your calculator. That's to calculate numerical derivatives. Of course, the 83, the 84, they really can't do symbolic derivatives the way that some calculators can. Um, but by the AP guidelines, one of the four official uses for your calculator is numerical derivatives. So now you know how to do that. Uh, we then went through and talked about how to differentiate the uh, e, or exponential function, if you will. Uh, we found out that it was actually very easy. The derivative of e to something is simply e to that thing times the derivative of that thing because of the chain rule. No problem. Uh, we then went through, and since we differentiated e, we uh, continued on by integrating e. And we saw that that really wasn't that bad either so long as the derivative of the exponent is present somewhere in the integral. That way we could do our UDU substitution. And finally, we looked at an example involving slope fields and another differential equation. These are very important problems, and there really isn't one section devoted to them, but we're lucky that they show up time and time again throughout our notes. So get used to using these slope fields. Uh, here we did a slope field in conjunction with the natural exponential function. So that was pretty cool. All right, so hopefully uh, this 
assignment, assignment 5.4, won't give you too many problems, I'm hoping. Uh, just remember all this stuff as you go through this assignment, and as always, good luck.